In our last episode of Upscaled, we went deep on how 5G works, and I mentioned that in the process I'd learned a bunch about the wireless technology that got us to this point. Well, a lot of you folks seemed interested in that too, so we're back with a follow-up on the history of cell network technology. Welcome to Upskilled, our explainer show, where we try to break down the tech that makes your gadgets work. And today, we're going to break down the G's 1 through 4 and everything in between. If you haven't seen our 5G episode, I'd strongly recommend you check it out. I broke down some of the basics of how a cell network is designed, like frequency reuse and cell patterns that we won't cover here. That said, a few quick refreshers. The G in 3G, 4G, etc. just means generation. Cell phones connect to towers using radio waves. Frequency refers to the wavelength of said waves. Bandwidth is how big a range of frequencies a device can use to communicate, and a new term we'll be using, multiple access, refers to a bunch of strategies that lets more users communicate with a limited amount of bandwidth. Got it? Good. There were attempts at mobile phones throughout the 20th century. Essentially, mobile telephone systems have been and still are two-way radio connections between a telephone in a vehicle and the regular telephone network. These early systems were expensive, and the phone equipment could weigh more than 50 pounds. Most people don't know this, but AT&T's Bell system started the mobile phone network way back in 1946. It was extremely limited. The phones were around 80 pounds and had to be installed in automobiles. The network first rolled out in St. Louis, where only three mobile telephone conversations could take place at one time throughout the entire city. The first real handheld mobile phone was demonstrated in the US in 1973, and the first generation networks launched in 1979 in Japan, quickly followed by systems in Scandinavia in 1981, and finally the US in 1983. This new and efficient system is the Advanced Mobile Phone Service, or AMPS. These systems were a huge leap forward over the early attempts. They had computers assigning channels, you could move between towers without getting disconnected, and they used cell patterns to help boost coverage in areas with more users. They also supported phones like the Motorola Dynatac and Nokia's Mobira Cityman, which were truly portable, if not exactly pocket-sized at nearly two pounds. Like this unique cellular portable made by Motorola, which weighs only 30 ounces. These networks also used a technology called FDMA, or Frequency Division Multiple Access. This divided the spectrum into chunks of frequency, or channels, and assigned each conversation its own channel. Combined with using multiple towers in a cell pattern, this let more people simultaneously use the network, usually around a dozen per tower. Using the cellular concept and the telephone network, Bell Systems scientists found a way to conserve a limited natural resource, the radio frequency spectrum. This scheme still limits you to the amount of available frequency, though, and these early networks were also analog. The audio signals were translated directly into radio waves, which also uses a lot of bandwidth, and they were completely unencrypted, so anyone with an FM scanner could listen into your calls. Another drawback, phones like the Dynatac cost around $4,000, took 12 hours to charge, and had 30 minutes of talk time. Uh, can I call you right back? Uh, I'm in the middle of something. 2G arrived in 1991 in Finland, and this was the first global system for mobile, or GSM, network. This is the cell standard that has taken over most of the world, and it brought with it a host of improvements over 1G. GSM used a digital network, which allowed calls to be encrypted and allowed for non-voice communication, things like SMS text messaging. It also switched voice calls to digital signals, which used far less bandwidth and would let even more people use the network simultaneously. This was helped further by TDMA, or Time Division Multiple Access. If FDMA split the spectrum into multiple channels and assigned each connection its own channel, then TDMA further split each channel into time slots. Multiple people could connect on the same channel, but they'd transmit and receive one after the other. It did add some processing overhead, keeping all the time slots synchronized, but it let a lot more people use the same tower than in 1G. In the US, a similar system grew out of our 1G networks called Digital Amps that also used TDMA. But this was mostly overtaken in the USA by a technology that revolutionized wireless communication, Code Division Multiple Access, or CDMA. This tech was already used in satellites, but Qualcomm developed it for mobile and marketed it as CDMA-1. In 1996, the first US CDMA networks came online from PrimeCo Wireless, a little company which would later merge with Vodafone's AirTouch Wireless to become Verizon Wireless. 
CDMA and TDMA are both ways of letting more people use limited bandwidth. If you think of phones as, say, a bunch of political candidates on stage at a debate, TDMA has each phone waiting to talk until it's called on, while CDMA has everyone talking at once, just in different languages. It was imperfect, uh, but it was a good deal for that moment. CDMA lets multiple devices all broadcast on the same channel, but each signal is encoded with a different code. The tower has a list of all available codes and can decrypt each signal into their original message. Compared to TDMA, CDMA let even more people share the same channel, increasing network capacity. The downside is more of the signal has to be given over to error correction. All that encoding and decoding can lead to mistakes, but because the phone can transmit continuously, it can still end up being faster. CDMA also helped with handoff, or when a phone switches towers. In TDMA, the time synchronization was a big challenge. The new tower had to add a time slot for each new device, and the actual switch had to happen in between broadcasts. In CDMA, there was no such problem. Phones could actually talk to multiple towers at once. These two systems went on to define mobile networks for years. In the US, Verizon and Sprint adopted Qualcomm CDMA technology along with a number of networks, especially in South Korea and Japan, while Singular, AT&T, and T-Mobile adopted TDMA or GSM technology along with the majority of the world. While CDMA proved to be more effective than TDMA, it took a while to catch on, and TDMA-based GSM networks actually got data connections first. General Packet Radio Service, or GPRS, sometimes called 2.5G, let GSM phones use their transmission time slots to send and receive internet data packages. This rolled out in 2001 and offered blazingly fast speeds in the tens of kilobits per second. Though really, at the time, those speeds were pretty revolutionary. In 2001, only 49% of the people in the US were internet users, and only 5% of those were on any sort of broadband. Most were still on dial-up. These numbers obviously kept going up, but the point is that even in the US, not everyone had wired internet. And even people who did, when 3G arrived, it was still the first real broadband a lot of folks ever experienced. One thing strange about this era is that once it became clear data on phones would be big, a lot of different ways of doing it showed up almost at once, though most took years to mature and become widespread. The first 3G networks launched in Korea in 2000 and brought the rise of real mobile internet, with speeds fast enough to allow web browsing, sharing photos, and eventually even video streaming. Many of these networks launched globally around 2002, and they all brought with them Qualcomm CDMA tech. CDMA1 networks, like Verizon and Sprint, adopted a 3G standard called CDMA May 2000, while the GSM networks rolled out a new suite of technology called UMTS, which stands for the Universal Mobile Telephone System, and a core part of it was W, or Wideband, CDMA. This was the end of the CDMA-TDMA split, but the new CDMA 2000 and UMTS networks were still incompatible, despite both using CDMA technology. Both of these networks used a new system called Frequency Division Duplex. In the past, phones hadn't actually been able to send and receive data simultaneously, but now, as long as there was bandwidth available, they could use a pair of channels to do both at once. WCDMA used a for-the-time high bandwidth 5 MHz per channel compared to CDMA 2000's 1.5 MHz, which required more spectrum to be allocated to mobile networks in a lot of GSM countries. This slowed down WCDMA's adoption in some countries, namely the US, but it ultimately proved to be an asset, with UMTS networks launching with speeds around 384 kilobits per second versus 153 kilobits per second for CDMA 2000. GSM's lead was mostly theoretical, though. WCDMA networks were slow to deploy. Even by 2006, only 20% of 3G users were on GSM, and CDMA 2000 quickly regained the speed advantage with EVDO, which launched in Korea again in 2002. A 3.5G tech, Evolution Data Only, was also developed by Qualcomm and made use of phase shift keying and quadrature amplitude modulation to boost speeds as high as 2 or 3 megabits per second. We explained these in our 5G video, but briefly, these are modulation schemes that use different radio wave shapes as a code that stands in for a series of ones and zeros. The more complex the code, the more info it can transmit, but the harder it is to read. 
CDMA 2000 networks were generally seen as faster and more reliable until 2006, when GSM launched HSDPA, or High Speed Downlink Packet Access. This used some of the same tricks, higher order modulation, along with improved error correction and lower latency to boost download speeds as high as 14 megabits per second, a huge leap over EVDO. This was shortly followed by HSUPA, which boosted upload speeds. Qualcomm didn't stand still through this era, though, with two revisions of EVDO, A and B, bringing speeds to around 15 megabits per second as well. But with HSPA Plus coming online in 2010, it was clear that the GSM UMTS networks were the new speed kings. HSPA achieved theoretical speeds as high as 100 megabits per second by using higher order modulation again, up to 64 QAM, and MIMO, which lets a phone connect to a tower with multiple antennas to boost signal strength. It took a while to get there, though. Despite launching globally in 2006, most US carriers weren't even switching on HSDPA networks until 2008. GSM's strategy of rolling out many incremental updates meant that potential speeds continually got faster, though through the 2000s, it also meant that some networks just skipped a generation or were slow to upgrade their towers. By this point, the divide between CDMA 2000 and WCDMA was pretty artificial. Most major companies, including Qualcomm, Nokia, and Motorola, were developing and held patents on both standards. Still, these 3.5 or 3.75 or 3.9G technologies, depending on how creative marketing departments got, laid the groundwork for a lot of the tech that would prove crucial to 4G. For a while, it looked like 4G might actually be even more of a standards mess than 3G, with Qualcomm developing ultra-mobile broadband, HTC, and at the time Sprint Nextel champion WiMAX, but something remarkable happened. As the advantages of HSPA became clear, almost every cell provider settled down and got behind LTE the 4G standard being pushed by GSM. LTE was pretty much the end of that CDMA-GSM split. Some network technology is still unique to either system, but LTE is actually pretty universal. Heck, in the US, Verizon even switched on LTE networks before AT&T, despite its own CDMA history. All of these 4G techniques relied on a new access method called OFDMA, or Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiple Access. This splits each channel into dozens of sub-frequencies and broadcasts a different signal on each one. These signals are aligned so they're orthogonal to each other. That is, when one wave is peaking, the other is at zero. And this is a bit of a simplification here, but essentially this not only lets an individual device send and receive more data, it also allows more users to share the same frequency. Beyond this, LTE allowed for wider bandwidth channels, up to 20 MHz, along with 4x4 MIMO and up to 256 QAM modulation. More bandwidth, more antennas, more modulation, just lets a phone send and receive way more data. It also used carrier aggregation, a technique first used in EVD over Vision B and later in HSPA+, which lets a phone group multiple available channels together to access even more bandwidth. All of this together lets LTE hit theoretical speeds of over a gigabit per second, though you won't see that in the real world. And there you have it, the history of cell communication technology. Now, this doesn't remotely cover everything. There are some weird backfill upgrades to older networks like Edge or 2.75G, which is what that dreaded E icon stands for when your phone stops being able to load anything. And also, if you live in mainland China, first off, how are you watching this? And secondly, it's a totally different situation over there with a lot of time division tech not really used anywhere else. If you did miss our 5G episode, be sure to check that out too. And are there any other topics you want us to dive into? I really want an excuse to research why 5G messes up weather predictions, but I need to convince my editors you folks are into it, so let us know in the comments, and we will see you next time.